Good morning. It is the 30th of July. We are almost through the 100 days. Some of you are starting to count down towards the 15th of August. Uh, that will be more the old school crowd. I'm sure many are thinking more about the end of August uh, as far as getting through it. Um, we've had plenty of timely rain, so the prediction that we were going to get into some very sticky wickets on high temperatures this week obviously did not appear, and the forecast of the hundreds uh, we did not see. Now, I, I, I know there was plenty of humidity um, to run around and there was most definitely plenty of rainfall uh, based on my experience yesterday at Medallion in Westerville where I got soaked. Um, there was also rainfall during the week around the state. Uh, I would not say that it was widespread. I know yesterday Cleveland did not get anything like the rainfall uh, that we saw in the Columbus area, so uh, somewhat sporadic. But on average, uh, or compared to the normals, Cleveland has caught up. Uh, we were running about two to three inches behind. And uh, this morning, uh, just right now, when Dr. Sh Gardner and Dr. Shetler were able to get me lined up, uh, we were able to discover that we were only about a half inch behind. Um, online today, we've got Dr. Dave Gardner and the inimitable Dr. Dave Shetler. Uh, first up, Dr. Gardner with a weed update. All right, good morning, everybody. So yes, uh, for the end of July, the first thing I wanted to do was to provide a shameless plug for our field days next week on August 4th. Wednesday will be the Ohio Turfgrass Foundation Field Day at the OTF uh, Research and Education Facility. Uh, got a good program lined up. Um, and then the following day, August 5th, is the Ohio Lawn Care Association Field Day. Uh, I don't have a graphic for that, with apologies, but we do have both of our field days uh, next week at the OTF Center. So um, the weather is going to be nice. Um, if you uh, have uh, any inclination or the ability to please uh, come to those field days, we would love to see you. Um, in particular, at my stop, I'm going to talk about the latest and greatest for crabgrass control. I've got uh, uh, mesotrione and topramazone and quinclorac uh, in different combinations. So a uh, demo looking at crabgrass, how to control it when it is uh, actively growing and tillering, which can be a difficult time to uh, try to control crabgrass. I've also got the latest and greatest chemistries to uh, look at control of dandelion clover and uh, ground ivy. So um, again, that's just one of many stops that we will have at that field day. Um, so do please come out next Wednesday or Thursday. Um, one thing to discuss also if you do come to the field day as I would love to know your comments about uh, the control of some of these other weeds like prostrate knotweed, prostrate spurge, and purslane, in particular prostrate spurge. Um, I would say that recently um, we've had an application of a very high quality um, broadleaf herbicide uh, made to uh, parts of the uh, OTF center in preparation for the field day to uh, try to get things cleaned up and looking good for that event. And that product did an excellent job on things like dandelion and clover and ground ivy, a lot of weeds, but uh, I have an area in particular where there's a lot of prostrate spurge and uh, it looked like nothing happened to it, um, like we were spraying clean water. And so again, um, you know, I want to show you some things, but then if you can, you know, like um, tell me, uh, you know, like your success stories with uh, any of those three weeds, that would be a great thing. And then I can get the message out to others. Um, <clears throat> had a question this last week about field pass phalum um, and its identification and control. And the question in particular was, do I have Dallas grass or field pass phalum? The bad news is, is that it's really hard to tell the difference between the two of them. The good news is, is that in the context of control, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, both of those could be treated interchangeably when it comes to control strategies. Both of them have a very broad leaf blade with a very bright white midrib, um, and they have a seed head that looks nothing like crabgrass or foxtail or goosegrass. Um, it's a, it's a, a two-spike uh, seed head with very, very fat, dorsally compressed is what it's called, um, florets. Uh, with a bright green midrib. And so that, that makes it um, a relatively easy plant to identify uh, when it's going to seed. But then also um, both of those grasses are unique in that they're tropical grasses that are actually perennials um, in, in this part of the country. And what that means is, is that like crabgrass and goosegrass, they have to come from seed every year. This is coming back, well, it can come from seed, but it can also persist and come back from underground storage structures. 
And so um, in May in particular, when you see this leafing out, it's not tiny little seedling leaves. It's, it's you know, mature leaves like you would expect to see coming off of a, of a stolen. So um, this is a, um, a difficult grass, but uh, I, I have had good success controlling it with topramazone um, at this time of year. Actually, the time of year isn't as important. A topramazone seems to work pretty well on this. The key is, is that um, sometimes you can get good control of the top growth and then the plant tries to come back from the not entirely controlled below ground structures that make that grass a perennial. And so if you see it emerging again in May, then uh, you should hit it again. But again, if you come to the field day next week, we can talk much more about that. But like I said, the initial question, is it Dallas grass or is it field pass palum? It's difficult to tell the difference, but the good news is, is that it doesn't matter because with either of those topramazone is the herbicide that you should be using. Um, now, the last thing that I wanted to mention was, which has nothing to do with weed control, um, but uh, just because of the calendar date is that uh, if you have areas that you're going to be reestablishing this fall from seed, the window of application of that seeding is anywhere from August 15th to September 30th, depending on the species. Um, if you were intending to put your seed down August 15th or earlier, as you might expect to do if you're attempting to seed with Kentucky bluegrass, then now is the time to be thinking about any non-selective herbicides that you need to use to control undesirable plant material in those areas where you're going to be doing the seeding. Um, if you check the label, they usually say, you know, wait at least a week. Um, I, I would say give it a little bit longer so that just in case the first application of the non-selective herbicide doesn't give you complete control, you have a chance to go out and make a second application and still have time to uh, get those seedlings out. And so again, um, just a quick reminder about that, but otherwise, you know, weed control, that'll be the topic of uh, interest when um, I'm making the presentation at field day next week. So if you have the chance, do please come out. And that's what I've got. Thanks, Dave. One other question that popped up this week was specifically focusing on rough bluegrass again with the cool down. Uh, there may have been some loss of the uh, dormancy and obviously that moisture. The question was, would it be viable um, to start getting after the rough bluegrass right now or is it kind of a um, hurry up and wait? I think we're still in the hurry up and wait mode. As with the control of other grasses, um, the challenge is getting enough herbicide into the plant tissue to translocate through and control all of the structures that are making the plant a perennial. And so even though you see some green leaf tissue coming back, it's probably a not enough living tissue area to get enough herbicide into the plant um, in order to get meaningful control of those stolen. So, Unfortunately, it's still a waiting game. You probably want the uh, rough bluegrass to be really lush and nice looking when you attempt to control it. That's going to um, make it more likely that you're going to get enough herbicide into those stolons to actually get long-term or permanent control. Now, not that we're encouraging uh, extra applications here, but would it be also a possibility if someone decides to make two applications, would that be an approach that could be taken here or it's still too early? It's probably still too early. Um, I would think that if anything, an application now, it's just going to so that the rough bluegrass comes back much, much later or maybe even the following spring, but it's probably not going to be enough to get rid of it the way that they're hoping to. Okay, that's fine. Um, without further ado, then we'll move on to Dr. David Shetler. Thanks, Ed. Uh, I guess the, the first thing I want to uh, point out is that uh, as an entomologist, we're kind of in that summer doldrums where we're, we're, we're in between uh, fighting white grubs. Uh, we've already had the bill bug and chinch bug uh, infestations and, and so forth. But I do again want to emphasize, uh, this is a picture of, of my front yard uh, taken this week. Uh, and that lawn had pretty well essentially gone dormant about three weeks ago. Uh, and with the we've had they've been sufficient to green it up and i want to point out if you got lawn on your care uh and sport fields on your care and they've had that kind of water green them up and they haven't greened up you better get out there and take a look they had bill bug damage uh you may have had chinch bug damage uh, and that turf is dead uh, and so uh 
you may need to go ahead and, and think about reseeding those areas at the time that, that uh, Dr. Gardner had indicated uh, later on in, in August. Second thing, uh, have heard from uh, some of the golf course superintendents up in the northern part of the state that they're experiencing cutworm damage on their greens. Uh, and uh, uh, watch out for that because you are in a zone where you could also have crane fly larvae. Uh, and, and my feeling is, is uh, go out first with that detergent flush, a couple of tablespoons of, of uh, Joy or Dawn uh, uh, detergent and a couple of spread that over about a one square yard area. And if they, if they are cutworms, they'll pop up immediately. Uh, however, if they're crane fly larvae, I find that crane fly larvae often need a double flush to get them up. They're really tough little rascals and, and don't react to that. So why do we know the need to know the difference? Well, almost any of the pyrethroids, will, the cancers are easy to kill. But if you try to apply a pyrethroid to kill the crane fly larvae, they're just going to laugh at you. And, and you really need a combination product. Uh, the, the most effective ones have been things like Triple Crown uh, that, that have pyrethroids plus a neonicotinoid. Uh, my, one of my favorites is a loft, uh, which contains the clothiididin plus bifenthrin. Uh, and, and even the electus or electus equivalent, you can make your own uh, by using uh, imidacloprid and bifenthrin. You can make your own electus. Uh, those combination products seem to give the double whammy. The, the pyrethroid seems to irritate the, the uh, cream fly larvae, uh, and then the other ingredient takes them out. And, and so make sure that you're dealing and applying the right product for the right critter. Uh, that's all I've got to say, uh, and hope to see you next week at our field day, or if you're in the lawn uh, care business, uh, at the lawn care field day. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. It uh, most certainly got sketchy. So one question based on your internet connection that I want to revisit there. When you were talking about control of the crane fly versus um, the black cutworm, can you reaffirm what products were best for each of those? Yes. Uh, for the, the caterpillars are easy to kill virtually any of the pyrethroids. Obviously, bifenthrin is, is the easiest one to get on the market but uh, you can use any of the other pyrethroids, they'll take them out. When we're dealing with the, the crane fly larvae, we really need a combination product. And, and most of the combination products that work quite well are the ones that contain a pyrethroid plus a neonicotinoid. Uh, that would be something like Triple Crown, Aloft, or Electus. Thanks. Now, two things. One, of course, I did send you pictures off my lawn, so I did have uh, uh, billbug uh, damage. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be the tree lawn getting some more seed again this fall. I have had a brilliant summer, as everyone has seen on Twitter. Uh, the other thing was we did see some black turf grassitanias walking across the greens at the research green at Hawk's Nest. Problems or any issues there? Those are the uh, new adults that, that have come in. And, and here's the deal. Uh, black turf grassitanias can attempt a second generation, and they can usually have a second generation. But the reason why they're there is black turf grass atinius are dung beetles. And I've always chuckled, what is the equivalent of a giant cow patty in your lawn? Wet thatch. And, and so uh, where we get trouble is on golf course greens and tees that have a bit more thatch than they should. They've not been you know, properly core aerified on, on a regular basis. Uh, and that thatch is being kept wet by over irrigation. Uh, and, and so if you've got a, a thatch layer that's constantly moist, uh, yeah, you can have a second generation of black turf grass atinius, And you might need to be thinking about if you haven't treated those with a grub insecticide, you may need a second shot of, of one of the grub insecticides. So that's why we use that green for disease research, Dave. It's <laughs> lovely. Good stuff. I did not realize that that's a good indicator for that. Um, we have all kinds of scalping going on and we've got a fair amount of dollar spot pressure showing up on it too, along with some fairy rings. So it's been, uh, yeah, on the disease front, really rust and dollar spot are probably the two, two most common issues that have probably popped up this week uh, with all the moisture and those cooler temperatures. Uh, and in the grand scheme of things, I think most people will be like, eh, not a big deal. Um, 
definitely a little bit of a cool down from last week. Uh, from my standpoint, I will be talking about nozzles and uh, predominantly using one gallon per acre carrier volumes for post emergent control of crabgrass uh, and looking at a whole host of different nozzles next week. And so we have de some demonstration plots with it. Hopefully, um, the product we applied yesterday did not get washed all the way to. Um, South Africa because it rained uh, like Dave Garner said like uh, the Lord was peeing on us so um, it was pretty heavy volume and intense. Dave's like no I didn't do that did I and we're not editing it folks um, without any further ado we are all looking forward to seeing you next week um, it's your foundation and association please get involved it is critical to us that the OTF is a success each year um, we're also planning I, I think one of the best conferences we've had in a long time with us with content and that's with apologies to previous speakers that's not a knock on them um but uh again we're back in person so we are looking forward to seeing a rebound in, in activity and um, a couple of things for next week dr doug carter new chair is going to be there uh all uh, by all accounts we have some people from the college uh, at the upper level of administration coming out as well. So make sure and come out and see them and, and, and let them know that the industry supports everything they're doing. Uh, that's equally important to us as well. Uh, without further ado, we'll see you all next week and thank you for your time.